Lives of the Unconscious. A podcast on psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. Episode 11. How one becomes what one is. On the false self. Be yourself. Magazines and the internet are full of these and other kinds of declarations. While calling on others to be themselves is easy enough, most of us find it much more difficult to put it into practice ourselves. Unfortunately, finding one's real, true self is in fact not so easy. For while the true self is something that, by all means, wants to be found, at the same time, it always manages to evade active searching. The self doesn't allow itself to be wrenched violently out of the dark hollow in which it lurks. It is almost as if we were trying to observe a snail. And in order to entice it out, we continuously tapped on its shell. Instead, the true self seeks its own moment of revelation. What we, and above all else, our environment, can contribute to this is to pave its way, so that it feels secure enough to reveal itself, to manifest itself before us. That is, after all, an essential task of every psychotherapy. Not to find the true self, but rather to assist it in its own coming out. But what exactly is this true self? And why is it so important to us? For a start, let us take a look at the land of self-representation par excellence, the internet. On YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, etc., the self is celebrated like nowhere and never before. The topic self is booming, for better or for worse. The comments are full of admiration for idols who are authentic, as opposed to utter contempt for those who are totally fake. Even the culture industry and with it advertising, has long since discovered the topic for itself. Don't be a maybe. Keep it real. And stay true to yourself. Those who upload a so-called coming out video of themselves, whatever is disclosed within it, can be assured of receiving attention. The no other videos on those channels achieve as much success. The popularity can perhaps be explained not only as a form of solidarity exhibited by more and more people, but rather perhaps also in that many people can largely identify with the individuals in the videos, in that deep down they too are longing for a coming out of the closet of their own true selves. A sense of self that is perceived as profoundly intertwined with one's own identity, but that, for a variety of reasons, perhaps cannot be openly shown. And that needn't have anything at all to do with sexual orientation. All of us know this to a certain degree. Each one of us has things they don't want everyone to see that we would rather remain hidden. We project outwardly something that we are not, a false self. One could even say that concealment and assimilation are downright required, that a false self represents an important prerequisite for proper functioning in society. We thus all find ourselves on this spectrum trying to balance between a true self and a false self, between masking and exhibiting our true face. Even in language itself, we find this tension. So, for example, in the concept 
person. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, a person is a human being regarded as an individual, with specific traits and characteristics that are unique to this person. At the same time, the word's etymology contradicts exactly this definition. The word person derives from the Latin persona, which means the mask and the role that is portrayed. The portrayal of a role, indeed not that which constitutes a human as an individual. Donald Winnicott, a distinguished British psychoanalyst, devoted himself to exactly this question of true and false self, and developed a quite distinct concept, which gained wide acceptance within psychoanalysis. Winnicott, too, would attribute a certain degree of false self to each one of us. With some people, this distortion goes to such lengths that they distance themselves too far from their self. They feel alien, become increasingly unhappy, and ultimately become sick. One could roughly and schematically distinguish between two types of false self those who know who they are in truth and those who do not know who they are in truth. Included in the first category would be, for instance, those people who have their coming out. But in order to be able to show themselves, they must first have something to show. If I am in fact left-handed, but, for example, have been compelled to live as a supposed right-hander, then at least I know that my true identity is that of a left-handed person. The true identity, the true self, is already known, but leads a life in secret, concealed under the mask of the false self. This first type is the easier form of false self. Easier not because it is any less difficult and conflict-laden, or less painful to live with. It is easier because the problem has at least been made tangible to the person. For there are people who, to remain with this example, do not even know that they are left-handed the fact that something isn't right with them, that something is wrong, often only finds indirect expression. For example, when essential parts of identity are affected, a general sense of dissonance crops up, possibly a deep feeling of emptiness, of disorientation, and yet without actually knowing why that is. These symptoms, and a diffuse yet very fundamental feeling of not knowing who one is, could, roughly speaking, be signs of a graver form of false self. Difficult, therefore, because the identity as it has thus far been lived has been called into question as a whole. If a framework that has been laid on a questionable foundation begins to sway, it is not uncommon for it to lead to suicidal crises. The true and the false self are, in this or similar terminology, indeed not new concepts at all. Already long before Winnicott, they were reflected upon in religion, philosophy and psychology. One need only think, for instance, of the famous inscription over the Temple of Delhi. Know thyself. As concerns psychoanalysis, Winnicott brought a crucial variable into play. The other. In particular, the environment of early childhood. Who we are is not something that we experience alone through ourselves. Who we are is something we experience principally through another. An other. The true self, according to Winnicott, 
is rooted in those very early experiences in which life expresses itself and how this resonates with close caregivers. What Winnicott means by this, above all, the processes of the infant's entire body, its spontaneous vocal utterances, gestures, facial expressions, and so forth. Throughout the day, the child continuously displays and sends outward these and other signals that repeatedly stimulate the dialogue between it and its parents. One can imagine how formative an impact this exchange can have on a personality still in the process of emerging. This can, for instance, even be the father returning a smile briefly when the child beams up at him, or indeed, the lack thereof. It is the parents who can help the infant's still subtle expressions to unfold. For the child crucially needs another to mirror its spontaneous and primal expressions, as such, who effectively confirms or diminishes them, who names them. But that also means that the parents must be capable of seeing the child for what it really is. That isn't always easy, because, in all probability, the child has not only traits that the parents find pleasing and familiar, features will also reveal themselves that are for the parents aberrant and seem alien, which, after all, is nothing more than individuality. That is the task of the parents, if, that is, they are capable of recognising and accepting this. An example. A woman who would say about herself that she values that which is generally considered to be feminine has a small girl. And yet this girl shows a particular interest in things that we would rather attribute to the so-called masculine. Now, at best, this should lead to a crucial series of events. The mother places herself into the mind of her child and recognises there something that she doesn't see in herself and that it is perhaps even something different that she would have herself wished. She notices, my child is in some respects indeed similar to me but has other traits that are entirely her own. Should this somewhat simplified example transpire in such a way that, as Winnicott would put it, is good enough, then the child will, little by little, develop a concept of who it is, and this experience will be accompanied by a feeling of continuity a sense of being in contact with oneself and with one's own vitality and will experience its life as meaningful. If, by contrast, the parents are not able, for whatever reasons, to see the child for what it is, it can, in the worst case, lead to a disruption in this experience of continuity. For the sake of clarification, let us go back to the example of hand preference. Let's imagine that the infant always sticks its left thumb in its mouth in order to suck on it for pleasure or comfort. This takes place spontaneously and quite intuitively from within. Each time the parents notice this, they remove the child's thumb from its mouth and try to bring the child to content itself with the right. This needn't proceed with brute force. In most cases, this kind of thing takes place very subtly, in rather implicit actions that are perhaps configured playfully, perhaps underscored by explicit words, accompanied, for instance, by a friendly sing-song. The good hand? The bad hand? The child thereby learns 
that which I perceive as intuitively harmonious, that which I am from within, is wrong and evil. If I readjust, if I assimilate, I will be right and good. The example of hand preference is admittedly somewhat simplified, yet we can imagine it down to the infant's subtlest stirrings and utterances. The child holds the potential for formation, on the one hand, and the risk of deformation on the other. At this point we come back to those people who feel empty, who pass through phases of total confusion, disorientation, and the feeling that they don't know who they are. Those that are especially affected are often precisely those highly sensitive people who are particularly good at conforming to their environment. Conforming to their environment meant at one time their parents. Ordinarily, a change of conformity to resistance takes place, and that's exactly how it should be. But there are children who are necessarily reliant on their ability to adapt, and who, already as infants, sense exactly what the parent expects of them. For if they do not function in the way their parents wish, they will suffer dreadfully. That could be insults or punishments, in some cases even beatings, or alternatively, and this is perhaps even more devastating, their caretaker turns their back on them, disappointed, lapses into silence, or ignores them entirely. In Alice Miller's The Drama of the Gifted Child, gifted, that means for her, the highly sensitive child, this process between parents and child is convincingly and plausibly depicted. The sensitive child discerns the subtlest needs and wishes of their caregiver and knows exactly how to satisfy them. The advantage, the necessary attention and affection of their parents, the satisfaction of their need for love. However, the more the child adapts to their caregiver's needs and the less room the parents allow them for their own individual needs, the further the child will separate from their self laying the foundation for the development of a false self. The false self, a mantle, offering a still further advantage. It serves as a defence, obscuring and protecting the vulnerable, true self, like a mask does the face. The true self, the living core, that perhaps still remains completely undefined and undeveloped, to show this true self can, in some circumstances, either real or merely felt, be existentially perilous, or at least bring on an intensely painful experience, the recurrence of which must be avoided at all costs. The pain thereby arises from a feeling that some essential trait has not been seen rightfully. One area in which we experience ourselves as particularly efficacious is in success and failure. If a child has painted a beautiful picture, or sung a song, or picked a flower for their father, then it is important that the other, in our example, the father, sees the child therein, recognises their wish and effort, acknowledges this and encourages it. The child notices thereby, what I do, it has an effect on others. As a consequence, the child is able to sense themselves. But not only success, also failures are important sources for experiencing ourselves. 
usually a failure, is first mortifying for the self and can trigger all kinds of negative feelings, such as anger, rage, sadness or jealousy. Yet the experience of disillusionment is important. Disillusion, in the truest sense of the word, dispels us of our illusions. We are set limits, and the perception of limits is particularly important for children. That is how we gain a sense of reality, of what is real and possible. Through limits, we experience who we are, where our domain begins and where it ends. Limits compel us, not only to give up, they also spur us on, motivate us to stretch and expand them, and even to transcend them. Whereas false acknowledgement or praise doesn't at all accord with the disappointment actually felt, can be downright fatal for the experience of self, even if well meant. If parents, instead of containing their child's disappointment and frustration, instead idealise them in every situation, in an unrealistic way, the child will experience the attention that they receive from the outside as less in accordance with what they themselves sense. They will find it difficult to develop their own valid sense for when they truly succeed and fail. If this replicates itself over many different situations, this sense of not being seen, be that a form of over or under appreciation, can contribute to the development and reinforcement of a false self. I have no understanding of what I can and cannot do. I don't know in large part who I even am. According to Winnicott, the true self is always preserved within us, shielded by the false self, sometimes already in a richly embellished form, although sometimes still very raw and amorphous, only accessible via intuition. The true self can contain potentials that are restrained, but also weaknesses about which we are ashamed and which we would rather conceal. Whether we hope for it or fear it, the true self will always be somewhere in us. It is like the preference for a hand. No matter the amount of will, training or punishment, at its core it will not permit change. A psychotherapy can offer the opportunity to learn to look oneself in the face and, in the spirit of Nietzsche, become what one is. This podcast was written and produced by Cecile Lutz and Jakob Müller. It has been translated by Suleiman Lawrence and is read by Rebecca Dyson-Smith.